Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back everyone to EduTour live chat number 38. Uh, we are going to be having a pretty special session today, I think. And how many of you have seen, here's my object R for today. How many of you have seen one of these before? Do you know where this comes from? Who wears these? Who makes these? The camera's focus is struggling with it, but who can recognize where this comes from? And who makes these? Zulfi, you've probably seen a lot of these. So this folks is from a very, very special place in Pakistan. One of my favorite destinations, not only to go to um, personally, but also to take edu tours to. It's a very special, very ancient space. Um, gee, you can't hear me. That's a little bit peculiar. Let's see why that is. You should be able to hear me. This should be okay now if you check. Uh, let's see what Jean thinks. Yes, so if you're absolutely right, then isn't it a special place? Salam, Jean. Welcome on board. Good to see you. And we're doing a little quiz on who knows where this comes from. Ah, up in the mountains. Yes. And Kalesh, Kalish. What is the name of the place? Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. Nice. Nice. Ancient as ancient gets. You see how they're wearing them on their heads? Yes, yes. And here is the book. The Kalash. Uh, kalash. So Just the Kalash. I'm fixing, I'm fixing my uh, new, new place to be. So for everyone else, this is a great book. While Jean settles in um, on the Kalash. The Kalash are a very special oh. group of people up in the mountains. Um, from heading west from Chitral. It's an incredible terrain of just black, vertical chatans, just edifices that are frightening. And they live right now in three valleys. But once upon a time, many thousands of years ago, the Greeks claimed that they are part of their heritage and blood lineage of Alexander and his group. Uh, the Parsis, the Zoroastrian community in Pakistan, believes that they're much older. In fact, they're part of the much earlier Parthian invasions. So they're actually part of the Persian Empire before Alexander arrived. So it's quite incredible. There's about 3,000 of them left behind. I'm sure there, been, there would have been, once upon a time, a lot more. And they would have obviously been closer to the Indus, but over the years, they found themselves more and more into the mountains. Uh, it's an area that's also called Kafiristan. It's right next to the Wakhan border, which is no man's land between Afghanistan and Pakistan. So we talk about bioregions. We talk about the mountains, the role of the water, and the folks coming in, heading towards the River Indus. Then there's communities like this that get created, and they develop, and they get left behind. And it's really quite beautiful in many ways that they're so hard to access that they've actually retained their ancient pagan rituals that are very, very gentle, very fragile, very sensitive, very aware of the alignment of the sun to the earth and the role that they play in between. And of course, modernity insists on trying to fit them into a box and insists on uh, pushing them into certain religious beliefs, which uh, obviously causes more harm than health. So I, it was a book I, was, I spotted today when I thought about us talking about ancient peoples and how often it's unfortunate how often something ancient is just sidelined as being primitive when in fact it has a lot more to offer than many modern structures and many things we call civilized in fact end up being far more civilized and far more primitive 
and barbaric than what one claims to be as primitive. So I thought this would be a great time for us, Jean, for you and me to chat. Wow, look at that. Sorry, I've just noticed. Well, wow. I apologize. I'm in a room that has north and south windows. So I set everything up and the sun moved. <laughs> so I was scurrying around trying to find a new place. And I apologize for being so discombobulated. <laughs> but, no, but I think I think you need to you need to send an email to the sun. Yeah. Because that's that's really like inappropriate behavior and it's so out of line knowing that we have this scheduled every Monday at ten. I mean, could it not have done its movements just an hour later? Like it wouldn't have made any difference in the history of the sun for it to have just waited for an hour. <laughs> I mean, nothing, it's not even a fraction in it, the amount of years it's alive. I mean, that's really selfish and unfair, I think. But the picture is gorgeous. You're looking clear. Everybody will accept and will be happy to see you looking bright, clear, not blurry, not pixelated. There's a great background. There's not a big, dark, cavernous, scary uh, tunnel behind you. And the sound is clear. So I think our internet test has worked so far. Well, your desire to change the course of the sun is exactly what the, some engineers are postulating we should do to deal with the climate emergency. We should geoengineer all the planets around the Earth to deal with this crisis that we're facing now. So you picked a really good example in terms of how progress, engineering, manipulating the cosmos is the answer. I mean, that's what civilization has brought us. So I know you didn't intend that, but you no, I No, no, no. I think that's, that's spot on because the word progress really gives me heebie-jeebies now. And, and the word civilization makes me just a little bit nauseous. So I, I just think that without getting into my digestive and bowel movements, it's, it's, um, it, these are really problematic conditions. And for engineers to even have the gall, Gene, to think that they, to even think about this, it's like I'm suggesting it because I would like the sun to be just just for once, a little bit kind and, you know, I mean, it gives us so much beauty, but they want to do it for power and greed and deeper control of the systems. I'm not interested in controlling anything or um, any more power than I already have, but which is not much, um, none. But I think that, I think these engineers need to go through a workshop of surrender and sit in silence for a month no internet, no computer, no glasses. So they see everything blurry and pixelated. I think they, they need to really go through some character building exercises because they're so obnoxious. Can you imagine somebody's even thinking this? Instead of fixing the climate change issues, they're thinking, how about we just shift the celestial processes because we bungled this up in the background. So stupid. Well, I have a book to show you. Yes. Ta-da. <laughs> and like all my books, it's also backwards. Yeah, Dictionary of Indo-European Roots of Words. Oh, wow. So this, this is my Bible. I'm giving away the source of looking for roots. And I have to confess, I was shocked when I looked up the origin of civilization cities. You won't believe this. It's it just, it's still, I'm still like, I don't believe this. It actually, the root of it is the bed, the couch, the beloved, the household, and then the land, the measure of the land that the household is on. That's how the roots from which civilization evolved. And you and I have been talking about, well, what other wor words are there besides ancient 
or primitive. And here the very word of civilization evolved out of the first clusters of people who formed communities. And it really isn't until cities appeared in the 17th and 18th century that civilization was, what would you call it, appropriated to describe the characteristics of cities and the government of a hierarchy. So I was just like, I couldn't believe this. It's the most intimate place where people meet in the bed. And then the household. And then the, the, it, the, it's called it the measure of, of land. So the land the household is on. And then we know it goes into many different areas before it reaches cities like, like bioregion, community, <clears throat> culture. So I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of uh, amazed. Because, you know, what we're trying to do is find a sound that isn't seen as looking back and being nostalgic. And lo and behold, the word civilization had this amazing meaning that it's lost. So that's, you have to take over. I'm still yeah, kind it's, of- It's entirely lost. I'm, you're absolutely right. I didn't expect that because the word civilization, if its root is the space with a bed, it's that level of intimacy. That bed is the last thing that anybody civilized ever wants to talk about. I mean, it's hilarious. So you, we were discussing, you know, everybody has been, every so often I'll get these messages saying, we know you guys are having these conversations on the side. And yes, we are. These Monday, Thursday chats are actually little like um, pinhole camera versions of what we're really talking about. There's multiple conversations that happen in the background. And the one we had yesterday was about the absurdity of those that claim to call themselves civilized. They will not talk about the most basic fundamental human needs, the body needs, the carnal needs, the maintenance functional needs. They will not talk about the bed or the bathroom or the WC or remember Andre Serrano's um, Piss Christ, that sculpture that oh, had, yeah. oh my god in the late 80s early the, the u.s was in mayhem um italy the catholic church vatican one was up in arms and you just sort of think all right so it's really a form of the same water that went in <laughs> like it hasn't turned into nitric acid or uh, something radioactive it's not turned into like blood with some diseases in it. I, I don't really understand. So, I mean, fine, it's, it's supposed to be waste product, but then there are also people who use urine when you have a snake bite at the beach or a blue, uh, jellyfish bites you. It's, it's something that's used as a healer. So you just think that why are we so ashamed of, you know, did God go wrong and like really do some design work that for some reason we think is wrong? Because nobody wants to talk about stomach aches and nausea and bowel movements and the bed. God forbid anything is ever discussed about what happens in bed or what the bed is meant for other than rest. But you can rest on the floor. So it's interesting. They will, they will object to activities in the bushes in the park and they'll object to activities in the cinema theaters and in public toilets. But nobody will discuss that exactly the same activities happen in the bed. And then suddenly it's okay, but they don't want to talk about it. So it's this bizarre, like civilization has sucked the color and life out of itself. It's, it's done this like vacuum treatment where it's shrunk wrap itself. And huh. now it's suffocating on its own nonsense. Oh. You know, so I think this whole modernity, progression, civilization is just, it's got to uh, urbanity, even, even this urban business yesterday. A friend of mine posted on Facebook something about the new urban should be this number of houses and this kind of street and flowers and whatnot. And I was like, buddy, the word urban is a problem. 
you need to reconfigure and rethink the word urban because right now urban is a toxic nihilistic environment you come to anything that's urban today because you uh, either want to challenge yourself or you're suicidal or you're masochistic or you you have no choice i mean for those of us who've been who've been raised maybe we have no choice but there is it the whole urban thing the civilized thing and then i think about primitive you and i have spoken about so many beautiful indigenous tribes we talk about indigenous people mariam nizam talks so beautifully about the aborigines and the acknowledgement of land and the hoi ploy of the uppity civilized call them all primitive and you know this is my colonial colonial uh venom venom <laughs> you're a venom. snake if <laughs> you've been bitten and you need i've been bitten you know it, it's it's been pumped into my jugular for millennia for centuries so i mean it's so bizarre and and remember that film daughters of the dust yes. and i told you that the one thing that really bothers me was they were in white clothes not only white in color but also white folk civilized folks clothes and i wanted to see them in in their own colorful wraps that are like version of the sari and they all have turbans this it's a very fluid elegant wrap it's not this constructed detailed ocd infested outfit you know with the little lace and the ribbon it just went on and on and on ad nauseum those clothes were awful so you know the victorians did that Mm. You got to here. Up to here. Up to here. Yeah, you got to cover up. Up to here, up to here those corsets. Oh my god, those corsets. People complain about bras today. What about those corsets? Horrific. So well, I I think that a new word is very one. Are you wearing one? <laughs> so so the you know the word primitive you said that the the word primitive is nostalgic. You know Gene if it was just nostalgic I wouldn't mind so much but often times the word primitive is used in a condescending negative manner so primitive use is used in a term where they don't know or we know better than them or oh they can't speak english so they must be primitive or they don't wear proper clothes so they must be primitive or they eat food with their hands so they must yeah. be primitive um Oh, they only wear loin cloths on their lower half. They have nothing on top for either the men or the women. They must be primitive, or they do painting on their face or masks. Um, so I don't know if primitive is just nostalgic. I think today the word primitive is as a very negative connotation, and in my mind, the primitive is where. the solutions and the answers to our questions lie because the civilized has shrunk wrapped itself and vacuum packed itself for so many years that it's actually lost its own identity and its own integrity from where it began and to go back to the basics we go back to the primitive i think oh you think do you i didn't know that you thought <laughs> every so often like Okay. So, first of all, what I meant was Oh, sorry. When hear us, hear you, hear me say ancient or primitive. <coughs> the, the word has become associated with a nostalgia for something right. that was in gone and in the past, but like you just showed us. Here's this mountain community making these absolutely beautiful beaded work that still exists. So yeah. what I was what I was yes, what I was pointing to was how we don't realize that words have judgments attached attached to them. And and when you and I bring a culture into our discussion now, it's not in the past anymore. It's True. here. right here and and that's what i think that's why um we have to i would like 
us to find a sound. All words are sounds. Find a sound that isn't so automatically judged in this progressive linear imposition on history that civilization has made. Everybody who came before cities and urban and, and citizens, they were all like you maybe pagan or primitive, all these words that have become judgments. While there are other words that describe that group in the mountains that you went to see. And you made a you made a guidebook about them and with and they were so happy. Yep. The children even in the pictures are so happy that you're there. I mean obviously you and your group didn't treat them as if they were remnants of something no longer relevant. You valued what they were doing and what they did. So if we can find a sound that affects people openly rather than, oh, primitive, and they close down their thinking and they don't think it's relevant, the way that community was living, that small group, is exactly what we need a, a word for now. I mean, would you call them a culture? I was thinking, trying to think of words. Are they regional? Like you described how they're really in the mountains, hard to reach. And the mountains in the back of the picture were unbelievable, the photographs. So the earth is still very much a part of their consciousness just like this measure of land which was an early meaning of of the root of civil so a sound that people can be open to you know what is it that's so valuable to you in those heritage sites what other word could you use that embodies yes they're part of my heritage, part of where I come from, part of who I am, but wouldn't make anybody think they're no longer relevant. I mean, you just gave some reasons they're not relevant. Karachi is disintegrating and falling apart. The rains come, which come every year, just like the sun comes in the window here, and the infrastructure is not ready. And this is happening. This is now. People are moving out of New York City. Midtown. Office buildings are totally empty. I read a, an article yesterday about a man who had a cart to sell hot dogs on the street, right in the Midtown. That would be the best possible place. You could bring your, you know, place where someone could come out of their office, get a hot dog, stand around, talk to their friends. Now there's no one there. So this, this vendor had only sold, sold 10 hot dogs in the center of Manhattan. All those office buildings are empty. People are leaving. And Detroit, they already left. So there's really this kickstart to this disintegration of cities is what I perceive. And where are they going? Well, these are interesting questions. And are they going with friends and forming like a, a household of like-minded, but choosing a place where they want to contribute? I mean, these are all, to me, the important questions about heritage. Does somebody go back to where they were born? Is there a pull from the land there that they aren't even aware of, that they want to at least go back there? So the sound, the sound of what it is that those two words actually carry in them that isn't a value judgment. And we, you know, define the equivalent of what it is you value about the mountain community, what it is you value about the heritage site, the necropolis, and start using these words because words have the power to change people. To, you know, we, it's, we're not going to wait for what you and I are talking about. It's, it's here 
right now and we're trying to understand what's here but it's not anything anybody's ever known before so that this going back idea gene is really really interesting because there's two things that you've made me think about one is uh when i was leaving the us so you know one is living in new york and your friends and family and anybody you've left behind thinks that you're there because life back home cannot provide you with what new york can there are many things of course that's true that new york can not provide me that uh, that can new york can provide me which karachi can't but there's many other things that's vice versa so when when one comes back i think for many people the pandemic is a really frightening space because they are having they're feeling almost like they're having to come back with their tails between their legs having left their homes with their real gung ho that i'm going to go live in a better place and the grass is greener on the other side and i'll make more money i'll make more dollars i'll have a cool 212 address and i'll be living in manhattan and they'll think that the cat's whiskers and now all of a sudden it's over the dream is shattered the bubble has popped and they have to like a sheepish dog go back home and face the music so i think those of us who cho- who choose to come back home when i i do face this people think i'm crazy that why did you why did you leave the west and come back here it's home i mean isn't that enough reason for me to come back with all of its problems there's a huge list i posted on facebook yesterday of all the daily problems that are badger us badger us all and not unique there's no single person persecution everybody has their issues and every city has its issues i tell everybody this in new york has its own issues barcelona has its own they all have their own bureaucratic administrative issues racist issues language issues all sorts of issues, tax issues gender issues all kinds of nonsense that's part of the civilized world right civilized so you come back and you have to face this attitude of people in your home saying why do you come back like there's a shiny glitzy west why didn't you stay in like the like the icon of capitalism isn't that a better life and i'm wandering around the heat and the dust and the sand and puncture tires and exploding gaskets cuz it's too hot etc and eating on the floor blah 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 but the ancient heritage sites gee i feel always have more information than i do so when i am there i feel primitive and they feel civilized so i think when somebody looks back at today from a thousand years they will say these people were primitive so today we are primitive for somebody 1000 years from now and we might even be primitive for people who are res- the architects who are responsible for building the ancient sites that i go to they might in their graves be laughing at us but look at what these people worry about how stupid look at their concerns look at their fears they worried about buying shoes and bags that have weird labels on them you know we we had diamonds in our headgear and on our feet and on our shoes and there's the queen of england wearing the kohinoor in her crown so where's the civilization there and i i think that we are primitive and the ancient sites that we deem nostalgic and write off as primitive and barbaric and because they're chronologically older there's so much for us to learn from and in my mind that anything i have where i go some place where somebody can teach me more where i can learn more they are more civilized than i am so i i always find myself to be very humbled and extremely uh on elegant in these places in any of our ancient sites any of them across pakistan from the kalash you look at these building you think wow i mean i'm constantly saying wow how did they do this how did this magic almost magically happen you feel very small and uh, and very primitive so i think that before we look for a new word for primitive one conversation would be to say that we draw a line and we are here it's the old this is the old civilized 
which is now primitive. And we've got to come into this new space, which is not civilized, but a new primitive. What would that sound be? I... <laughs> well, you know, I agree with you 100%. And what's in the mountains and what's along the Indus River is the earth and the things that humans have made. So when you talk about the difference between the way we live now and what's evident in these places that still exist is there's a communication with the earth and with the, the planets and the stars. So they're part of the place. And that, that I absolutely agree with you. That's what is missing in the cities. And just fundamental things, the elements of life, water. It's no different in New York City. The water roars down the streets, gets caught in the uh, crosswalks, the drain pipes are not uh, working, and then it enters into the same system, the streets, you know, with the gasoline being washed off, plastic, it enters into the same system with the, what we call the sewage from bathrooms and kitchens and domestic places. So those two things mix and they pour out into the river. As as recent, uh, I remember hearing from a, a Korean veteran, in other words, a U.S. soldier who went to Korea for the Korean War. And what he was talking about was called nightshade. So here are all these soldiers coming and eating the food that's local and coming out of their system, the poop. And the population collects the poop as fertilizer because it has in it the nutrients that the food took out. That's what nightshade means. So as recently as the 1970s, the cycle of life represented by that firsthand story from this soldier, that cycle of life was still available to experience. And that's what I think is so powerful about communities like the one in the mountain or now sites that are preserved like the necropolis, the earth and the sky are part of the place. And occasionally in New York, I remember, it'll, it'll be one of those full moons that's very close to the earth. So then it looks like it's right in your face. And this street grid in New York is not cardinal points east and west, but enough so that when the moon rises, you can stand on certain streets and you can see. And people come out of the bars and out of the cafes and out of their apartments, and they just stand there. You know, what is this? What is this? So I absolutely agree with you. It's so important to have that experience because then you begin to know what you're missing. And that's one of the difficulties in our cities. People are unhappy. They're missing something, but it may only be what put in front of them. Why don't I have new clothes? Why don't I have a wonderful apartment? What are these luxury buildings? But the homeless, the homeless in New York are a very interesting group because mm. they don't want to be part of the system. They don't want to go into the places provided for them. They, in effect, are critics of the way we live. And they choose to live on the edge on their own terms, because they don't want to be in this hierarchy that is basically a consumer-driven power structure. 
So they go underground. As you know, they live along abandoned underground subway tracks. You know, they live in places where they don't see the light, but to them, it's worth it. They don't have to be part of the system. They don't want anyone to come and take them, a social worker. They're perfectly happy. So I absolutely agree with you. And what to call bringing the things that we both value in these ancient and primitive places into a, a world that doesn't exist any longer where it was created or they're just being marginalized. But I think everybody who's listening knows on the margin is where the beginnings of, of a powerful, uh, like a seed. Like I have a huge white pine tree out my window here. It just started from a little seed. Yeah. So <laughs> the, um, I just think it's very important to me where do words come from? Like when I look in this, I'll show my trophy. You show your beaded crown, I'll show I'm, my trophy. I'm, I'm listening, you're saying sounds, and you know, it's got little jingle bells in it. So I'm listening to it and saying, can you please help me? I need a word. I need a sound. See if you can oh. hear the Yes, 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 yes. Yes. It jingled. Like wow. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's... Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely I can hear it. Woo! That's exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. The, the values that we often associate with ancient cultures, primitive cultures, are the same values I see you learning from an elephant. Yes. So, uh, you know, there's, there's that dimension to it also, that it's very hard and um, very rare in a city that you can actually have a communication with a wild, what we call a wild animal, unless they're in captivity. And then they're considered dangerous and, you know, something to be studied. I'm not studied, stared at. But your first, I want to say firsthand. Oh. Oops. I'm so sorry. I, just, I don't know. There's like this energy wave around me right now. It just fell off. I didn't touch it. There's no wind. I mean, I just now, want to and now we don't see you, Gene. I can't oh. see you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that the elephant, whose territory in, in Africa is the whole continent. I don't know what its territory, you know, Kavan's territory is in uh, East Asia, but they have huge territory, like whales, and yet they're gentle. They're, you can feel in their eyes, even though they, even though he's been tortured, that he, you know, he still wants to communicate, like with you or, you know, anybody who I send his picture to. They're like, oh, look at the soul. Look at the soul. So, I'm just trying to say that these things that we value about the heritage and the primitive, they're here all around us in so many forms, so many forms. But you know, the, the, the more I hear you, the more I feel like, you know, anything that's urban is soulless. Our cities are unforgiving. They're relentless and they're unforgiving. You know, what I learned from the ancient primitive wisdom of Garvin is his forgiveness and his ability to retrust our cities don't allow you that breathing space to they're they're very rigid like you said constructed in the capitalist system 
Um, and I don't think that the urban space was ever meant to be that way. I think it has become that way in the last 200 or 300 years, where it's become a very fascist, relentless, difficult, unforgiving, soulless space, where you are constantly being pushed and challenged for things that you shouldn't really have to be worrying about. And I, I use that blanket statement across the 20 cities that I researched for you. And those, the, those the, 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 we were looking at the patterns those patterns, the social patterns in all these cities, the social cultural patterns are the same uh, across the board. So it's Hong Kong, it's Shanghai, it's London, it's Paris, it's Beijing, it's Istanbul. It's, they all have similar traits where life is so difficult. And you just wonder that if industrialization and modernity has created this fascist system we call civilized, and they're celebrating the disconnect with the earth. They're celebrating the disconnect with the mountain or the moon. So when you see the moon on the street, you think it's the first time it's shown up. It does this 365 days a year for millennia. And you're just gawking at it like a complete idiot, as if it's, the, as if it's a sort of one-off performance. So I think that even, even it's, you know, transportation, like you people live in cities because they have access to different kinds of foods or different kinds of clothes because of trains, because of refrigeration. But today, the interesting thing is that if we look at resorts, spas, any place that is talking about revitalizing your body, you pay them premium, an arm and a leg for creating a jungle experience, for creating a spa experience for giving you mosquitoes, for giving you lizards, for giving you uh, water in rough, edgy pools where you would cut your skin against, but it's not the swimming pool at the YMCA with the blue tiles, so you pay $30,000 extra for it, for that experience. So there are people who've already realized that the primitive experience has a really precious value to it, and they've already started capitalizing on that. There's, there's spas and resorts and hotels all across Southeast Asia that have, have realized this. The yoga, the meditation retreats, all of these people are doing the same thing. You don't have to wear any clothes. You're in an open air. The gym is in the open air. There's a thatched roof above. You don't have to wash. You don't have to deodorize. You eat vegan food. There's no meat. You cook your own food. You wash your own clothes in the stream. You wash your own dishes. The water is all recycled. There's only a small bucket for you, you know? So all of those things that we would normally have written off as a game show on television called Survivor, it's <laughs> actually, it's, people are actually paying a lot of money to leave the civilized world and go to the primitive and experience that very earthed, grounded, aligned humanity all over again. So I'm not sure if that word is primitive at all. Do you, did you ever go in New Mexico to Ojai Allende, these hot water pools? Yes, but yeah. I, I, I spent, yes, I went once, but I, I'm, when I'm talking to you, it's funny you should ask me about that, sorry to interrupt. I also spent a fair amount of time at 10,000 Waves, the Japanese ah. um, spa there, so yes. Well, the uh, Allende is ancient, in other words. Oh, that, yeah, it is. It's a natural uh, pools, and it until recently was very um, rough, not artificially rough. In other words, it was the pools. There were dressing rooms, and you you know yes. you went to the different pools, but no big lottied up. Now it's very expensive. It's transformed, like you're saying. So in effect, for me, it's not authentic. It's not authentic. It's not the real thing. The minute you do what you just said, right, get something available only to the very rich. And then you also take the roughness out of it, the rawness. There's something uh, to me very important about places that aren't quote finished. And actually, um, Many of the Southwest indigenous people 
And I'd be interested to know if it's the same in the Indus Valley. In their beadwork or in their weaving, there's always a hole. And not a hole, but an irregularity. Something like the hole in an Egyptian pyramid. And it's meant as a place for the person who made it, whose spirit is in it, to leave. But it's also a place where you can come in. In other words, it's open. So when what's, what you just described about the places you might go to eat the food that used to be the food that people ate or the water they drank, yeah. it's not authentic. It's packaged. Mm -hmm. And it's, I hadn't really thought about this. It's the openness of, a, of what the, the weavers, the cooks, the architects, the musicians, it's the openness of their system so that others can join, but not necessarily, you know, there might be several groups that form a community. Now, I don't know how um, that mountain community was organized, but it's that openness at the same time that you, you keep the intimacy of the smallness. And, you know, you make clusters. There, there's so many different ways. So, again, you know, sounds, if sounds hit your body intimately, to use the word we are using today, if they really don't say buy a Gucci this or whatever people buy, if they really affect your body, then you, you, you want to be part of it. You want to join. You want to help it grow. And, and that's what I feel this moment in time is calling. There, there's all these openings, like we just talked about, people leaving the cities. And empty spaces. Nobody knows what's going to be made because it isn't a plan. I mean, it's the same thing in, um, you see in buildings they call additive. This, instead of a perfect geometric form, th this isn't uh, buildings that are tombs or gathering places for a community. These are the places people build themselves and live. They just keep adding on. It's not a closed system. There's no perfect form. Maybe perfection is another word that describes what's happened to what we dream about. I actually think that this collapse of the megalopolis is it's reached its glass ceiling and it has to stop its continual fascist growth. Um, there is a fantastic film called 12 Monkeys with Brad Pitt in it that shows a city completely overrun by wild animals. And the, the streets have broken and trees have come through and buildings have gone green because there's nobody living in there. Anymore. It's cold. Some of it has, I think, got icy cold and there's bears wandering around. Yesterday, a friend of mine playing golf in upstate New York posted a little video of a bear, brown bear, walking across the golf course. And he was so shocked. And I said, you know, it's not inappropriate for the bear to walk, be walking off your, go your golf course is on bear land. That's what you didn't realize. So he doesn't get it. He replies to me, he says, but I'm in upstate New York. I said, it doesn't matter where you are. That's probably even more reason because you are in upstate New York, you're on bare property. That's why he's walking through there. You shouldn't be there, that stupid golf course of yours. So that was the end of that conversation, but I think it left him thinking about this. And so these animals have taken over the city and I think our cities need to be brought down and, and reduced into uh, bite-sized morsels. They've just become, you know those massive sandwiches that you cannot bite into and it just falls apart? It's like that, we try and bite into them and you get one fifth of the sandwich, the rest of it's on the floor, it's on the table. 
and then you have to scoop it up and it's waste. So I think our cities have become like these oversized sandwiches that we need to go back down to just a simple old school sandwich that goes into your mouth elegantly. You can share it with others and life goes on just fine. Nobody's starving to death without the bite sized without the massive like triple decker sandwich. Nobody's gonna starve to death. You can do just as well with just two slices of bread and a little bit of whatever in between. So, you know, the, the, this, this, you're right about the, the ho hoity-toity spas, but the, the fact that we need to reconnect and that this whole primitive business, um, definitely it's the, the ancients were ahead of us. So when you talk about the Kalash, if I look at how the communities are laid out, very similar to Mohenjo-daro, cluster, courtyard, cluster, courtyard, corridor, cluster, courtyard, corridor, mini, lots of little micro communities within the larger group, families, 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 as the family extends, they build their own cluster of courtyard homes. So they're, they're integrated, <clears throat> they're, they're connected, they share a lot of things but they're not like our so-called civilized cities. Not at all. Well, there's a very interesting comment. Yeah, I was just let's reading that. Yeah, let's return to be resourced by wells of ancient primordial traditional practices. That's it's got so many powerful sparks. Jean, you know, read the one above that. Read the one that Architect wrote above that. Primitive let's, residual let's of return. dominant Western, dominant Western let's, colonial civilized mindset feels very uh, othering and diminishing to ancient richness, 100%, a version of the word exotic. So I really like the word othering. What was the word? Othering. So if you, if you scroll up, to what this, I'm not sure who's typing on behalf of Architate. I don't okay. have a name there. But if you scroll up a little bit, Architate's previous message says primitive, residual of dominant Western colonial civilized mindset feels very othering and diminishing to ancient richness, a version okay. of the word exotic. I agree. Wonderful, wonderful. Otherness, I mean, that's exactly Otherness. well um like the romans considered those people who weren't part of the roman empire as the other as barbaric i mean all these words that have gotten this other other have have been uh negative and we even say it now you're not like me you're the other I mean, this is all the dualism today that's causing so much friction um, and, and tragedy, real tragedy. So othering feels very othering. That's, that's a lovely new verb. Wow. Yeah. I like that. I yes. like that verb very much, othering. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to be othering. But again, we, what is it we want to do? So that's, that's, I hope every, everyone who's writing these beautiful comments will comment on the video of today. So we can really remember exactly the way you put it. Cause I can remember this, but uh, it won't be this, it won't be the exact wording. Yes. So for whoever's typing on behalf of architect, if we could do us a favor, we will lose both these comments when we record it into IGTV. If you could do us a favor and just drop them into the comment once the video goes live, as soon as we're done, that would be hugely, yeah. hugely appreciated. Uh, thank you so much. So I think basically, Gene, what we're looking for, and I'm gonna throw this out for everyone, is there's the word civilized and there's the word primitive, ancient primitive. And we want to switch them so civilized goes into the back and the ancient primitive comes into the relevance today and tomorrow. Well, I have, you know, I have, if we don't pay attention to the earth, yeah. the earth it's going to have the last word. I mean, that's something that um, every 
culture. Civilization is a, a worldwide dominant culture, equivalent with being modern. Before that, everyone was aware of how, and I'm being, I'm being too, um, too general. Most people were very aware of, of how fragile human life is. In other words, survival was a key part of their lives. And that may in, inevitably meant they had to pay attention to what happens on a cycle. When to plant your seeds? When do the rains come? You know, what to, what to do when if you're going to survive? And we don't do that anymore. Like where we started when you were imagining getting the sun, which in fact you were, you did it. You did it. The whole place is crowded over here where the sun was, and out here in the back, it's shining. So, ah, who am I dealing with? <laughs> but, you know, just it's um, it's that to me. Now we are at the place because of the climate emergency, because of the pandemic, and they're not going to go away. We are in survival mode. And everyone, I think at some level feels that. How are we gonna survive? So we get these geoengineering fantasies, but they may try it and they may cause an unbelievable repercussion. I, I mentioned in one chat, a volcano that went off in Iceland in the 500 and created two years of total darkness. And that was a natural event. So, you know, who knows what we could do. So, um, survival, that just seems to me, if, if people understood that what's at stake now is survival, the earth is just gonna keep on evolving and going, it's moving. In fact, the Poles are just about ready, magnetic poles to switch. And this happened, hasn't happened in hundreds and hundreds of years. So more than that. So, I mean, all these incredible events, I guess because we're not at the poles, we'll still be able to hang on when the magnetic. Yeah, I, I'll still do my handstands and I'll still be yeah. upside down yeah. a few times a week. And, you know, at that point, anyway, north is not north and south. Yeah. And who knows where they all are? So yeah. it's a great little like reshuffling that happens like a, a hourglass for me several times a week. But you know, empathy. So the, my relationship with the sun that requested, I put the thing out to the universe saying, please give Gene the right light. Yeah. It's, an, it's an empathetic, symbiotic relationship. We love each other. The others are just trying to control it and make, and make it slave and serve their needs. There's a big difference. So I think if we can look at all of these things with a certain amount of empathetic gratitude, then it's not even survival. It will be something else because survival also makes it feel like you're gasping for air and you're dying and there's nothing wrong with dying. There's nothing wrong with the species being wiped out. That's part of the process. And if it, if it means that we're going to annihilate ourselves, then so be it. So I'm not so sure it's, it's, it's survivor is where we need to go, but the empathetic gratitude in terms of making primitive celebratory and contemporary would be a future that I would love to participate in. But on that note, as you can see, wait, wait, wait. Out of what, time. What oh, word, great, great, what, great, 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 great. Yes, the word you said was symbiotic. That's yes. a beautiful word. That, yes. Yeah, okay, I just want to say that. So symbiotic is something that makes sense to me. Yes. So let's work on that. Thank you, folks. Anybody who's put in a comment today uh, that we've talked about or not, please drop it in our comment box at the end of this chat because we lose these comments when it's recorded. Thank you so much for joining us, Jean. You're looking beautiful in this light. We'll see you here again next week. The light is great. The sun is on our side. Sound is great. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of the day wherever you are. Look after yourselves. Khudafiz from Karachi once again. Till next time.